And then you hugged or shook my hand on the way around the building. Please don't raise your hand. Just remind yourself, don't, uh, don't hug me unless you're praying for a miracle. And I'm allergic to cats, and people get around me, and they, they've got cats, and they'll hug on me, and I go, uh-oh. You get the feeling that, amen. I don't hate cats. I don't hate cats. I don't. I, I just don't have use for them. Uh, my dogs will sit. They stay. They come. They, they, uh, they're uh, very well trained as far as attack is dealing with uh, if there's any danger to my family. Never seen a cat do that. I've never seen a cat come when you call it. I know some of you got the special cat. I've already heard. Your cat goes in a box. That's cool. It's good. Got your Bibles? I know I just lost all my cat lovers. All online, they're going to they're gonna get the word out. I'll get boycotted. I tell you what, open to Psalm 139. I'll be there in a minute. Psalm 139. If your future is not important to you, then it has no value to others. Let me say it again. If your future is not important to you, then it has no value to others. To the degree that you value your life determines the degree of value you receive from people in your life. Now, Jesus said that a brother would lay down his life for another. Value your life. Care for your life, but to care for one another. Say this way with me. I am valuable to God. I am valuable to this generation. Therefore, I am valued. Many in our generation are going through life without a vision. They don't have no big idea. They, they don't have a plan for their life. For the most part, people just stumble half-heartedly through life, hoping tomorrow will be better than today. But they've made no plan. They have no dream, mostly just existing, hoping for a break. If there's been one thing I've done over the last uh, 20-some years of pastoring is try to help people find value, to find purpose, to find reason for living, to keep pressing on. I told my pastor out on the phone a while ago before I came in. Of course, you know, Pastor Mike's up in the St. Louis area. And I said, Pastor. I, I, one of the things I got near the end of the year is, I, is all the people that I uh, was over for funerals, memorials, people that we would use the term we lost. We don't have them here this year. They, they're gone from us. I pray that we gave them hope of the resurrection. I pray we gave them hope in a future to come. If there's anything that I've done in life, I want to give people hope. Can I get an amen? And I hope for the same for you. You know, death is a topic most people don't like to think about. You know, as a pastor, I spend a lot of time uh, counseling with people, talking with people, helping them through grief or accidents, funerals, uh, anger, uh, illnesses. And oftentimes, whenever I do a funeral, I'll ask this question. Tell me something about your loved one. Tell me something about it. And it's funny. Some people will go on for days. I mean, they got stuff they can tell. They'll tell stories. That they'll, some of them will tell stories I don't need to hear. I've often said at funerals, you know, there's certain things you need to take to the grave with you, amen? And there's certain things people have done, maybe you know about it, just let it go. But then there is that, that, that uh, deafening silence at times when I ask someone, I'll get called in to do a funeral, to do a memorial, and I'll get there and I'll ask them, tell me something about your loved one. I didn't know them, and you guys have, uh, didn't, evidently had, didn't have a pastor. You had a doctor, you had a lawyer, you had a dentist, but you didn't have a pastor. Everybody needs a pastor. I mean, I'm not just promoting me. I'm just telling you, you need one. And so when I ask them that question, they'll, ask, they'll say to me, uh, well, uh, and they stumble over anything productive, anything life-changing that the deceased did. At that moment, I struggle at, even as a pastor. What am I going to say? How, and I just got to go to the book. I got to preach the Word. I don't want you to ever get there. I want when you get to the end of your life that you've got a book to write. There are things to be said. There are people saying they mattered. They were here. They impacted my life. When you pass, you don't even understand. There were times they slid money in my hand when I was down. They came over and worked on my home. When I was trying to do mechanical work, they did something for me. She made me a cake on my birthday. I had a lady named Blanche Alexander. Every birthday, every Christmas, my, my brother and I got socks. 
Now, socks may not mean a big thing to you, but I waited on Christmas to get them socks. They meant something to me. I would get a, a, a coconut cake made by uh, uh, Ollie and Ines Hovatter would make me a coconut cake for my birthday. That meant so much. It was a homemade scratch. The reason I remembered Ollie and Inez's name was is Inez was real skinny, and her name started with an I. Ollie, I work off memorizing people like that. Some of you say, well, how, Pastor, how do, how do you know my name? Well, I can't. <laughs> Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Everyone ends up somewhere, but few people end up somewhere on purpose. The Bible teaches us, and you've got to get this inside of you, you are fearfully and wonderfully made. That means that God took his time with you. He had an idea about you. You were in his mind before he sent you into a womb to get you here into this earth. The good news is that anyone can discover a meaningful life direction. Everyone, just not the, the remarkably talented and, and physically uh, gifted people or fortunate people end up somewhere we can all do it we were designed from the start to live a unique reason uh, purpose Isaiah tells us in Isaiah 46 verse 10 the scripture says declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things which have not been done saying my purpose will be established and I will accomplish all my good pleasure this morning I will preach to you his vision our purpose everybody say his vision our purpose one more time his vision our purpose what are we going to do for 2020, Pastor? Vision. Amen. Our, his vision, our purpose. What he had envisioned for us, we're going to purpose. Psalm 139, are you comfortable? <clears throat> Psalm 139, verse 13. I thank God for prophetic and revelation of the Old Testament believers. That David had an understanding as a young boy, and I will say this to you again, illegitimate. David's was illegitimate as a young boy. His, his dad was not married to his mother. He had seven brothers that were all connected with one family. David was connected with another. I believe I can prove that out to you by not trying to, but I'm going to tell you something. That illegitimacy adds devalue to you. It devalues you because you feel like nobody cared for you. Nobody wanted you. Uh, kids that have been adopted sometimes walk through this. Sometimes even in your own family, you feel like you've been devalued by a father or a mother. You've been put down. But David saw something a little different. David had a recognition and an understanding that God had sent him to earth. Amen. That he was here for a purpose. And, and who knows what that purpose would be, but he discovered it. And I got to tell you again and again, you got to discover your purpose. You got to keep doing things. We say, well, that didn't work too good. I must be a failure. No, that means you don't belong to be a mechanic. That, that means you need to try something different. You know, if I can't uh, figure out how to fix the car, maybe I'm pretty good at driving it. I'm not a real great mechanic, but I'm a decent driver. I have sure enough slid some cars around some curves. Sometimes even successfully. <laughs> David said, for you created my inmost, inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. <clears throat> Again, David doesn't reflect back on, on knowing uh, as a matter of fact, if you read Psalm uh, 51, he'll actually go back and mention the fact that he was uh, uh, illegitimate. He actually says that in there if you kind of read between the, the lines there. But when he gets to Psalm 139, he makes a statement. I'm going to give you praise. I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place. When I was woven together in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. David had an understanding that God himself had written things down about his life. And he would have, now, there was adversity. There was, there was problems. There was, there was sin. There was recovery. There was victories. But God wrote all those things down. And he said, I realize when I look back on life, you ordained this. You set this up. Now, if you believe in the Word of God, then you are against the taking of an unborn life. Amen. Because there's life there. I don't care what your political stand is. That is my political stand. 
It's the bottom line. I, I don't care if you're Republican, Democrat, Independent, Socialist, Communist. I don't, if you're for life, I'm for you. If you're against life, mean you got a problem. Because that's the way I look at the Word of God. So here's this unformed child, and he says, God, you knew me there. And when I think about that, that means when I was in the, my mother's womb, amen, Marie Brewer Hovatter's womb, amen, God saw me there. And he had these things planned for me. He knew that I'd be running around and, and cut off overalls when I was a little boy, barefoot, running all over Wheeler Mountain. He knew that I'd be out in the woods hunting quail. He, he, he knew all the crazy things that I was going to do through life, and then he set me up. Your salvation was a setup. Amen. God put you in a place to fix you. And after he done that, then he begins to ordain and set some steps up for you. You've got to learn to live on purpose, keeping the end in sight. He invites us to seek him in order to learn what was his perfect plan. So the more I get after God, the more I start seeing this is what God had planned for me. Lord, I thank you for the word of God. I thank you, God. I, I, it doesn't matter to me if the whole world would be against the Word of God. God, I stand on this thing. I believe you. I believe that you formed everybody that's in my presence right now. You gave them a purpose. You have a vision. They need to fulfill the purpose. I give you praise for this house in Jesus' name. And everybody say it. Amen. Would you do me a favor? Set your Bible right down right now and give God your best 2020 praise this year. Would you do that? I often wonder if those watching us on the internet bust loose from their steering wheel and, you know, throw their Cheetos up in the air. Whatever they do, they, they go ahead and give God. I pray they do their best praise. In life, distractions are going to happen. You're still going to get bills. Bills, bills are nothing but a, a symptom of something you wanted. I said, Pastor, I, I get electric because you wanted electricity. Amen. You can live without it. You don't want to. A power goes off, you panic. You didn't get a cup of coffee. One thing I learned about the gospel is that God makes you for certain things. He created you. Mama, he created you to be a mother, to be a wife, to be a friend. Sir, he created you to be a man, to be a provider, to secure her and them Amen. He makes us for things. As a pastor, I realize I was made for this. People have said to me before, Pastor, you make this look easy. I do because I'm made for it. Amen. I don't sit back and go, well, I struggle. I, I meet pastors go, I struggle being a pastor. I, I don't know how I'm going to do this. And I think, if you stand up there act like you're struggling, can you imagine how the people feel right now? Amen. But when you feel confident in your calling, you know that God put you there for a reason, and you got energy for the task. Amen. He gives you a provision for the vision. Amen. That is so important. And without a vision, Proverbs 29, 18, and I know this is, is 2020, and we talk about 2020 being vision. We'll talk about that, I'm sure, throughout the year. But Proverbs 29, 18 says, where there is no vision, people are going to perish. If you don't have a vision for your future, for your family, you're not going to make it. You've got to have a vision for it. If there's no dream, no revelation, no vision, and with no sense of our created purpose, we perish. Where there's no vision of having a lifelong growing and personal relationship with your creator, your spirit withers and dies. You've got to have this connection to want to get to know him more and more. Without a vision to deeply matter to people, you'll live in loneliness and your relationships will perish. How important is it to say, I got to matter to my spouse. I got to matter to my kids. I got to matter to those around me. I, I want a relationship with them. And I agree with that, that, that the older I get, and I walked around this room, and I didn't know all of you. And I thought, I just, we need to have a party. We need to have a get-together. <clears throat> we need to have something where I get to know people a little better. I pray this year, if you stay in this house, we get to know each other. 
that there'll be connections made, that, that you'll get to know other people around you, not just ones sitting next to you, but ones behind you, in front of you. And there'll be a lifelong understanding and, and experience that you have as you begin to understand the people in this house. Where there is no vision for meaningful work, people live for 5 o'clock. They just exist. A uh, goal to survive. They pay bills, stay married, keep the kids out of jail. I said, we just keep walking through this thing. But there has to be more to life than that. But, you know, we were made for much more. And you matter. Your value is greater than you'll ever realize. Oftentimes, I, 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 real, I was with some bikers yesterday, and I'd rode with this guy before. We actually rode with some Baptist guys. We just got invited to go ride with them, so we did a couple hundred miles. And it was good, and I was talking with a guy, and he said, uh, this jacket I'm wearing came from a friend of mine. I said, wow. I said, how old was he? He said, 60. I said, oh, wow. I'll be 59 in a few weeks. And then uh, he said, this vest came from another friend of mine. He took his life. He's 59. And I think about the friends of mine who, who've taken their lives and uh, even relatives that I've had that's done it. And, and I, if you live long enough, you've thought about it. It's crossed your mind. That suicidal tendency. You know, you say, Pastor, no, I just never cross. If you live long enough, things cross your mind. It may be a fleeting moment. Sometimes you harbor the thought, but you got to fight through that. you got to realize how much you matter. When my aunt took her life, let me just be personal with you. My mother crawled all over that coffin. She wailed like I've never heard my mom cry. And I, 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 was, I was a young man, a young teenager, and I, I saw this. And I thought, oh, yeah. as a matter of fact, no, I was, I was in my uh, early 20s. When my aunt took her life, I was in Bible college, and, and she had a, 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 my phone number next to her phone, and she had tried to call me. This was back before the day of the cell phone, so you didn't often reach people. And they believed she would tried over and over to reach me, and then she took her life. She had been paralyzed from a drug overdose, and things just didn't turn out the way they thought. And I watched my mom, and I realized my Aunt Sheila had no idea the value, the, the love, the care that this family would have gave her. And kept for her. And I say that to you that may be struggling right now. You matter to people. Your value is great. God knit you from the beginning. He thought about you. He wanted you here more than anything else. You, 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 may, you, you say, well, pastor, I'm all alone. It, you don't have to stay that way. The Bible says God puts the lonely in families. You know what church is? Church ain't nothing but a big family. Oh, yeah. You know what? There are folk in here. I, I, got, I got folk in here that are family, that are LSU fans. I don't like them all the time. But they family. Amen. Can I get an amen? amen? I got family that are blondes. Come on. Amen. I got family up in this house. They, they're still family to me. They come from all over the place. But this is my family. It's the house of God. Jesus had a purpose. He, there was a vision that the Father had that Jesus came to fulfill, and he lived it out. In Luke 19, 10, the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost. Don't distract me with everything else. There, when I see the church world, we get distracted easy. There are things that the little country church does, and we do it well. And it's important to me to not try everything every other church is doing just because it's on the Internet. Amen. You're not seeing smoke blowed up in this place. I'm not putting them down, but you're not seeing smoke blowed up in it. We ain't got a light show going on. I don't have a dark screen behind me with pretty lights for the Internet. When you watch us on the, on, online, what you see is what you get. Amen. It's, it's that simple. It's, it, and it's not because we're trying to flaunt our uh, uh, originality. It's just this is who we are. And if this is who we are, let's just be who we are. Can I get an amen? Amen. And I'll try to be something else. Because I've seen this in, in the life of churches. We watch what's going on. You know, we change the name of our church to, to you know, uh, this one name church thing has really gotten hot. You notice that? I mean, uh, you got Encourage Your Church. You've got Embrace Church. You've got Quest Church. You've got Hope Church. You've got uh, Fred Church. You've got Jim Church. you got, you, you got all, just every, every, but there used to be this real long name. You remember that? It was real long. Everybody got to one name. And now you don't know what they are. I was riding out in the country. I saw little country churches out there, and they had, a one, they had one name on them. They took that, that big name off, put one name on it. Uh, that's good. I'm not, I'm, again, I'm not against it. But I thought, and I even thought about, well, should we change the name of our church? I mean, the little country church is kind of outdated. Huh, it's outdated, it's the little, or, or does it imply this is who we are? 
Amen. We're a little country church, but it's an oxymoron. I didn't call y'all a name. But I said it's an oxymoron. An oxymoron is like jumbo shrimp. Calling the biggest guy in the room tiny. You know what I'm saying? Sweet and sour sauce. It's an oxymoron. It, it, it's, it's backwards. Which, so if you call it the little country church, it's bigger than the little says it is. But it's small enough that we can be friends. Amen. So important. So again, Jesus came, and this is, this is a fascinating thing to me. When he came to earth, he didn't get distracted from his call. Things were trying to pull him and distract him, and other people had different ideas what he should do. But Jesus had an idea that when he came to earth, there are two things I want to do. I want to defeat the devil, and I want to win the lost. And if you watch the life of Christ, if you walk through it, you'll see when he came to women, women with issues, amen, they had issues of blood, amen, they had issues of their children dying, they, they had issues with, with, with husbands. There was one scripture, I just, I just want to talk about it real quick. A woman came out, the Bible says she came out uh, during the midday, <clears throat> We're not going to look it up. I'm just going to tell you about it. She came out during the midday, and she's drawing water from the well. Remember the woman at the well? This is what the Bible calls the woman at the well. If you go to Walmart a lot, they call you the woman at Walmart. She's a woman at the well. So she goes out the well during midday because that way nobody was around her. The other women had already come out, and the women always came and got the water. And Jesus sees her, and he stays at the well. And the Bible says it's a strange little statement. He said, he must go through Samaria. Now, understand again, the Samaritans and the, and the Jews hated one another. They had racial issues long before you showed up. All right? So, so here was this fight that went on. And when Jesus said, I must go, if you had a Google's map and you Googled in how to get to a certain place, it would, oft, uh, it would run you through Samaria. You would take that longest route. You know when it shows you two or three routes to get there? You would take the long route around because you don't want to go through Samaria. But Jesus said, I got to. I must go through Samaria, which means his intent was to reach somebody that had an issue, to help somebody out. When he got there, he found this woman. And the scripture says he's sitting by the well, and she comes out, and, she, and you got to imagine, a woman that's had five husbands? Jesus even questioned her. And she said, uh, I got, uh, uh, I'm not married. He said, you're correct, you're not married. You've been five husbands, and the one you with now ain't your husband. Let me just mention to you, just a little bit, a little perspective. Five husbands? If a woman had five husbands, that tell me one thing about her. You, you're missing the point. She probably very pretty. She hubba hubba. The five men would notice that gal. But the first one didn't take care of her needs. The second didn't help. Third one didn't secure her. The fourth one was a knothead. Fifth one wouldn't get a job. Now she with the sixth one. She ain't marrying him because she don't know for sure. So I'm not here to throw stones at her because neither did Jesus. He looks at her and says, you know what? And then, and then all of this, she comes out there alone. Here's a man by the well. She don't know who he is. And then he goes, give me a glass of water. And she thought, my God, that's what the third husband said to me. He just trying to hit on me. I know what he's doing. He's trying to hit on me. He was like, I look good drawing the water up out of the well or something. He's he trying to hit on me. And Jesus said, if you, <laughs> Brother Shew Hart, you never heard that in the Pentecostal church, have you? <laughs> he said, uh, and Jesus said to her, he said, uh, if you drink from the living water, then you'll never thirst again. And then she began to relate to him some theology. And as they did, there was an excitement and a revelation that came up within her. And she went running into the city yelling, come see a man. He told me everything about myself. Let me help you. She didn't say, come see a man who condemned me over five marriages. Come see a man who beat me up over the immorality and the dealing with of all the folk I've had to deal with in life. She said, come see a man. He knows everything about me. Let me just put this in. Who still loves me? Saw value in me. Stop. But even the disciples, what are you doing talking to this woman? She's a Samaritan. Why are you talking? Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost. He did that for the men. Now watch for the, for, I mean, for the women. And then for the men, it was the same way. He healed the leper. He raised the dead. 
He, he, uh, he opened their eyes. He opened their ears. He gave them the ability to walk again. Jesus came with a purpose in mind. And when I see the vision of the Father, let it become our purpose in 2020. God, let us reach people this year. Can I get an amen? Amen. Well, Pastor, you don't know how bad they are. I was with so many bikers yesterday when the day was over, Sam. Amen. They were, hunt, they were probably 200 motorcycles when we finished on, on our route and running. And I looked around, and I saw soldiers of the cross and soldiers for Jesus, ambassadors for Christ, uh, Christians, motorcycle associates. I saw all these believers walking around with pastors on and not one of them not one of them looked like any of the church members I first met when I first got saved and I realized God you got a just vast array of army of people that love you amen John 10 18 no one takes my life Jesus said Nobody takes my life from me, but I lay it down on my own accord. This command I received from my father. My daddy told me that his vision was for me not to give up my life until it was at the end. So in Gethsemane, I'm not giving up my life. They picked up stones to stone Jesus. He just walked through the middle of them. Amen. If, if, if this bothers you, I just walk on out on the water. I just get on away from you. The devil gets Jesus on a high place in Luke chapter 4. And he tells him, he said, if you'll bow down and worship me, I'll give you all this out here. I'll give it all to you. Jesus said, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God. Him only shall you serve. I often was curious. If you got Jesus on a high place, he's 40 days weak from fasting. Why didn't you just push him off? Hello. Why didn't you just push him off? The answer is simple. He wasn't man enough. The devil ain't man enough to push you to make you do something. He got to talk you into it. Amen. John 10, 10, I've come that they may have life and have it to the full. He said, Satan came to kill, steal, and destroy, but I came that you may have life and have it to the full. I believe in having that life. Amen. His purpose was crystal clear. 2,000 years after Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, the world is still reeling from the shock of grace at the gift of endless life, uh, of absolute forgiveness, salvation, undeserved now, unasked for, unpaid for, freely given, simply by living out his father's vision for his life. Therefore, his vision must become our purpose. Paul believed in it. Amen. He saw the vision of the father. It became his purpose. Acts 20, verse 24. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me. If only I may finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me, the task of testifying to the gospel of God's grace. Let me just mention this to you again. This thing about Death, dying, all, we've lived well. We have to learn how to die well. And we've got to look death in the face and say, God, you know, Lord, whatever comes my way, I, I, I refuse. I, let me throw something at you. 20 years ago, I took out a, an insurance policy. An insurance policy, Steve. That in 20 years, if something happened to me, my family would get over a half million dollars. That's pretty good. Well, that policy runs out February the 8th this year. <clears throat> so I got to ask myself. No, I hate what I ask myself. <laughs> I ask myself, am I going to be worth a half a million dollars after 59? Or should God, you go ahead and take me now? Are you hearing me? These are thoughts that run through your head. They didn't, Sister Diane, they didn't run through my head when I was 30, 40. But I'm almost, I'm nearing 60. Now they're running through my head. I'm still worth, okay, I'll hang out there. I just needed an agreement. That's all I needed, somebody to agree with me that I was worth hanging out. In other words, I can't, I, I can't live in a life wondering if, when, when am I leaving in my expiration day. I just got to live life. You just got to live life. You just got to keep pressing in. Us and purpose is so important. Living out the son's vision. Imagine one disciple. Did you know that's what you are? When you got born again, you are a disciple. You are a believer who's being discipled to be like Christ. And all the young ladies say, you're believers that are being discipled to be like Christ. It's an amazing thought that God's doing that. So imagine just you. To, you, to our guests that are here, imagine you walked in here today and you are that disciple. You have to ask yourself, what is my mission on this earth? What is my purpose? You can make it simple to know Christ and to make him known. I want to know him, and I want to make sure people know about him. Amen. What has God designed you uniquely to do? There are people in here, you're, you're, you're so designed different than I am, and I from you. 
You have a different design. But God, it's unique. Amen. It's for you. And when you get a vision for what God has for you, things begin to change in your life. They begin to shift. You, you, what your once goals were are no longer your goals. I, you know, I just laid hands on my daughter, Jill, and sent her to Oral Roberts University. Well, I laid hands on Jill four years ago to send her to Blinn. And she came home. I looked at her, why are you home? Because God has a different plan for me now. I see things different. I said, all right, where is it going? So now I'm going to ORU. I got, a, I got a plan, Pastor. In other words, and listen to me, I was 21 years old when I went to college. I was one of the oldest dudes in college. You know, most folk go at 18. But they ain't got a clue of why are they there. This is always my question. Why are you going? Where can mom and daddy paying for it? Party. Then that's the wrong reason. Now, I know, I know that's, that's why you want to go. But the bottom line is, is know why you're doing what you're doing. So if I know why I'm there, well, I'm just going to stay there a couple years until I figure it out. Because you'll ask me, what's your major? I don't know. When they tell me that, I tell them this all the time. Just take business courses then. Just figure out business. Just anything in business, you're going to be fine. Amen. But, but, but don't just try to waste your way doing pottery. Let me close real quick here with four, four, some gifts here for the, without vision. First off, this year, focus your life. Start focusing your life. When Jesus came, he had a, he had a clear focus. Amen. When, when you can discern what you're supposed to do this year and the rest of your life, you'll know what you're not supposed to do. If you know what you're supposed to do, you'll know what you're not supposed to do. And if you spend time doing the do's, you won't have time to do the don'ts. I get people all the time, they talk about don't. You don't do this, don't do that, don't do it. And they go to, you go to church, they tell you, don't do this, don't do that, don't do it. And they just don't, 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 don't. I found out this. If you, find, if you have time to do the do's, you ain't got time to do the don'ts. Amen. And there's no time in it. You know, great love toward God equals strong resistance toward sin. The more I love God, the more I do things for God, the less I, I'm doing the wrong things. Good preaching. Thank you. Uh-huh. You know, I can't count the number of good opportunities and invitations I've had from good many people. But a good opportunity shouldn't distract me from the vision God gave me. You've got to ask yourself, amen, well, whatever it is I'm doing, am I giving God the glory? Focus helps me say no to good things and yes to great things. Number two, uh, with vision comes endurance. If I got a vision to press on, I, I remember when that first flood hit, when Harvey hit. It did affect some of you here. Patsy, Donald, you remember that. Amen. The things that happened in this place, in this area, of course, out in New Caney. But there ha if you got a vision for your home, if you got a vision for things to take place, then there has to be endurance. John 16, 33. In this world, you will have trouble. You're going to have trouble here. There's going to be T-R-O-U-B-L-E. Elvis said that. God's plan is certain to include some tough times. Nehemiah decided to rebuild the wall of Jerusalem. Amen. As a young cupbearer, he, he had to stay with it. Endurance is the word hupomene, which means the ability to endure. There's something about those who have always endured. They created this ability. And when I say ability, you learned it. You learned it. You learned how to handle life when it got tough. Some of you have said, I'd never eat that. That means you've never been hungry enough. Amen. I have never read, never read the ingredients of potted meat. Nor will I. I've not read the ingredients of spam. Nor will I. I will fry it and I will eat it. S-P-A-M, something posing as meat. I don't know what it is, <laughs> but it tastes good fried. <coughs> Are you with me? Oh, that's funny. You have to have an ability to say, no matter what I've gone through in life, I can, pull, I can make this. I've learned it. I've gone through it. Amen. I, it doesn't bother me to have had a little rough times because I have this ability. Amen. You learn that through life. Uh, vision helps you keep on pressing toward that. Next thing, with vision comes peace. People struggle with anxiety over their identity. Social media has exploded that. First it started out with, with, with MySpace and then Facebook and then MyFace and, and whatever else came along. But it, it just, it's exploded our identity to, to look better than what we really are. 
I, I like sometimes some, some ladies will put on there. You go, this is me without makeup. They'll snap that picture. And I'm wondering, uh, why did you do that? We figured if you wore it, there was a reason why you were wearing it. <laughs> Just saying. We fight with our identity. We fight with our looks. We, we, we fight with our purpose. Amen. You people struggle with their significance. Why, why do they show it? They have no vision. They have no vision. They have vision. With vision, you wake up. You know who you are and why you're here. If you live in your vision, you will live in peace. You will know that they are making, that you are making the proper turns in life at the proper times, and you end up at the desired destination. Jesus appeared. To, the disciples were befuddled. They were, they were lost. Jesus died on the cross. <coughs> he didn't resurrect. Uh, well, they didn't know he'd resurrected. He came to be their king. Now he's dead, and he's in a hole in the ground. And the scripture says that he appeared to Jesus and John. He appeared to Mary. And then the disciples locked themselves in a room out of fear, afraid. Because if you were connected with Jesus, then you were going to die. As a matter of fact, they all but one died. They all but one were martyred, but they didn't care then because they laid down their lives willingly. But for you to take it and to... to, to for me, for me to give it up out of fear, that's a different thing. So on the evening of the first day of the week, when the disciples were together, the doors were locked for fear of the Jews. Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. The Father's vision, your purpose is to have peace in life. This is important. This is John chapter 20, verse 20. 20, 20. After he said this, he showed them his hands inside. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. The Lord. Isaiah said, when I saw him, he was high and lifted up. When the disciples saw him, there were marks in his hands. Again, this is after resurrection. I know you're going to get a glorified body. Woo! When God takes you from this earth, everything that's not... Made for heaven, it's going to stay here. I mean, if you go up in the rapture, your hip might still be here. Are you following me? That pen in your shoulder is going to be here. Anything that and God's going to give you a new shoulder, a new hip, new hair. I, I stopped there. He'll give you all this new stuff. But when Jesus came back after the resurrection... Bore scars in his hands. If he's walking barefooted, you saw his foot come up. You saw the hole in the bottom of his foot. The scars that he had. He said, look here. Look at this. And after he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw him. Vision. Peace be with you. Vision brings peace. With vision, last point, comes passion. Passion. I can't always define it, but I know I want to see it. When I'm watching football, I'm a, I'm a junkie about football. I see teams that have passion. I, I, I told Joseph yesterday, I said, that J.J. what? That man got some passion. I mean, he sounds like a big white nerd on the sideline yelling at everybody, but he got passion. I mean, I say that in kindness. He just, he's yelling at him. They're looking at him like, whoa. And he said, come on, we need a spark. We need a spark. Don't say we got a spark. He started the spark. And then everything started rolling along. Show me a person with no motivation in life, and I'll show you a person with no vision. Great people are filled with great passion. There's something about having a passion for things. God is a, is a, uh, a God activating. Uh, there's something about him. He, he activates things when you're around him. He's motion activated. Let me tell you like this. Um, Moses walking, bush is on fire, and Moses sees the bush. It wasn't until Moses walked toward the bush that the bush spoke to him and gave him purpose in life about delivering the children of Israel. I was at Bucky's the other day. Bucky's is an amazing place. 
It's at a Texas institution. I, I was walking up to Bucky's, uh, somewhere down South Texas. As I walked up, as I reached toward the door, the door opened. Now I know that's crazy. Y'all used to it by now. But then I went into the restroom, and I started to wash my hands, and there was a faucet, but there was no cold and hot. I stared at it, and I put my hand underneath, and it was as if God spoke to the rock, and water started flowing. <laughs> I look at the soap dispenser, and it's just a mechanical thing on the wall. And I wave my hand under it. Whoop. Whoop. I ran it back under the water. Okay. Now my hands are wet. Now I look at the other thing on the wall. There's no crank, no turn, no paper. Paper. Here's the thing. I'd have never got in Bucky's had I not made a motion toward it. I'd have never got my hands washed had I not got my hand underneath the faucet. I'd have never got soap unless I waved at it. I'd have never got them paper towels unless I... <laughs> God is standing there going, when are you coming toward me? Amen. I got healing in my hand. Right. I got blessings on my mind. Right. I got favor I want to pour in your life. And you sat there. When are you going to walk toward me this year? When are you going to fast and seek my face? Amen. When are you going to ask, knock, and seek? Amen. And watch what I have for you. Oh, no. I'm going to sit right here because I'm Baptist. Ha. Ooh, I don't care what you said you was or thought you was, but I know that God is a motion-activating God. Right. Amen. And the more I walk toward him, the more things start to happen. Oh, I got to close, close, close. Great people are filled with great passion. The 19th century evangelist D.L. Moody was questioned by his peers why his ministry was so effective. He took them to his window peering out over the busy city of Chicago. D.L. Moody is the guy that's responsible for starting what we know as Sunday school. And he asked, what do you see? He said, we see people in a park. With tears in his eyes, he said, I see countless souls who will one day spend eternity in hell if they do not find their Savior. His vision, our purpose. Until you see people, that you know that when they leave this world, they'll never have an eternity with you. You see them in a burning hell, and it affects you. You found your purpose, because that's his vision. Heads bowed, eyes closed. How could you walk away from one who came from heaven to give his life for you? And all you have to do is accept Him. And then you'll find out that He has a vision for you. And it starts becoming a burning purpose in your life. He didn't take away the joys of this life. He multiplies them. He didn't take away your friends. He gives you new friends. He'll give you new playmates, playgrounds, and playthings. He'll take away addictions. But you've got to move toward Him. Because He's motion activated. That's the way God is. He says, come unto me, all ye that are weary and heavy laden. I'll, I'll give you rest, but you got to come. Ask of me. Ask of me.
The scripture says a simple thing, that if we call on the name of the Lord, if we do something, we'll be saved. If you don't know Christ this morning, would you make this day a change in your life and put your hand up? I'm not going to call you forward. I just want to pray with you where you're at. You say, Pastor, that's me. I do not know for sure I'm going to heaven. I want to know. Put your hand up and back down real quick. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Amen. When there are hands that are going up for people I do not know, I see a sincerity in you. Oh, I see God doing great things. You're so valued, sister. Sir, you're so valued. Would you pray this with me, everyone? Those that lifted their hands, allow this to be that turning point in your life. Lord Jesus, wash away my sins. Forgive me of my failures. On this day, the time that I have left on this earth, I will serve you, honor you. Your vision will be my purpose. I thank you for a new life, new friends, new family. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Now, come on, give God a crazy praise. that lifted your hand, I want you to find your Bible. If you don't have one, if we have one in the back, it's yours. Just ask for it. Start in the book of John reading it. Every now and then go back in the book of Psalms, Proverbs. When you finish that, come find me. I'll, I'll tell you something else. You can go into the epistles. Don't, don't wait out into Revelation. You'll drown. People still trying to figure that book out. I think they got it down, but all I know is the book tells me Jesus is coming. That's all I got to know. Amen. If I get our servant leaders to come up, I'm pressing for time. You know what I said? I want to get to know many of you. So many new people in here. Their weddings lined out for the year. Listen, there are two things here. First off, if you, if you have children to dedicate, uh, we don't baptize babies. But we do dedicate children, babies. We'll dedicate them. Uh, you know when your child's old enough to know that they lied. That they, that's a good time to help them understand accepting Christ. Then, of course, they can be baptized. But before that, as babies, we dedicate them the first Sunday of the month. So let us know in the back, amen, at the bookstore, that if you want a baby dedication, we'll do it every first Sunday. Also, if you want to be baptized every second Sunday, we will baptize you. If you need to tie the off an envelope, you're setting a precedent. Your genesis will determine your revelation. How you start is how you're going to finish. Start today tithing. Start today giving God your best. And watch and see what happens throughout the year. Amen. So if you need an envelope, lift your hand to our guests. We're glad to have you here. Before David makes the other announcements, I want to make one, one very important one. You got a, a, a poster of uh, Justin Gambino. This young man gave us one day last year. He had one opportunity, so he showed up out at the North Campus. He's had several tours to Iraq and Afghanistan. Sometimes you'll misjudge people. You'll look at them, maybe see a ponytail or a tattoo. You don't know, realize where they come from. This man fought for our country. And not only that, his passion for God, his musical ability. And I would say this to every age here, from our teenagers, to our older adults, this young man will touch you Tuesday night. Be here if by all means possible Tuesday night at 730. We're going to give him most of the service. But we, I'm telling you, what a blessing, Justin Gambino. And not only that, during the flood, he calls me. Pastor, anything I can do. Amen. He stayed connected. I've got friends in California that just found out that I know who Justin is. They said, you know this young man? He's incredible. She all enjoys music. I'm not just saying it just to be, I'm telling you, Tuesday night, this Tuesday night, first week, midweek, Tuesday night, be here. If you can't be here, be out at the North Campus on Wednesday night. Amen? Right. Yeah, and he really did. His, his music was based on what, I mean, he, he genuinely wants to see God and see God move in our generation. Yeah. And we need more of that. Genu Yes, sir. Uh, next Sunday, we are going to start our corporate fast. There is.